people are designing films with built-in conflict from the beginning. And it's much more difficult to, to take uh, ordinary real life that doesn't have this kind of built-in conflict where you have to find the, uh, the dramatic aspects of it, which much, could be much more subtle um, uh, than what, anything that you could make up or write or uh, anything that you might find on the evening news. In fiction, you're kind of limited to the things that you can invent, the things that are already in your mind, in the mind of the people that you work with. You know. But in documentary, uh, you're limited only by, uh, by the real world and your imagination of like your approach to the real world. You have to uh, storyboard the scene in your head uh, and while you're filming it, and the scene is changing and things are happening that you don't expect and you have to react uh, to the scene while it's going on and uh, it's like uh, instead of mm, classical music where you're practicing and practicing and you know all of the notes of whatever uh, Bach prelude or something like this uh, in documentary you're playing improvisational jazz you know there isn't anything written down on the page. You have to make it up as you're going along. Based on uh, what's going on around you. Well, the, the piano player is doing this and the bass player is doing that, so I, with my saxophone, am going to do it, you know, react in this way. You have to play the environment. The fun part, uh, as I see it, is uh, uh, taking a scene that happens in the real world, you know, like, uh, Kids are getting their hair cut, for example, or kids are taking an exam, or um, someone is working at an auto shop, whatever it is. Uh, you see this thing is happening, and you think to yourself, uh, if this were a fiction film, how would it be filmed, actually? How would you, what would you, how would you storyboard this scene if it were a fiction film? What's the language, what's the cinema language that you would use what shots do you need to tell the story of this scene? To uh, establish the location, to give the audience the idea of where they are, what's happening, what's the relationship between people in the scene, what's going on, you know. Uh, you're taking reality and you're making it into fiction language. But the fiction language is designed to immerse you in, in itself and you're using this a real uh, situation to, uh, to create cinema. Uh, and you can compete on exactly the same level as, uh, as fiction film. Uh, it just depends on your uh, filmmaking abilities now. You don't need a big crew. You don't need all of these things that people think that you need in, in fiction filmmaking. You can make something that feels uh, uh, just as much like cinema, uh, but uh, using the materials of the real world. And f for me, this is the exciting thing, that you, you don't have to be dependent. You no longer have to be restricted by, uh, by money in the same way that uh, has been the case in the past. Um, you can be free now. Uh, and I think people haven't woken up to this reality, uh, that you can make extremely high quality from a technical point of view, high quality cinema, but you can do it on a micro budget and you can do it the way you want to do it, you know, because of this micro budget. When you're looking for a character, you want someone who is uh, confident enough to say something, and also kind of, I'm looking for people who are sort of natural poets, you know, people who will say something that's uh, beautiful without even realizing it. You know, and there are some people like this who they have a natural way of speaking, they're not afraid to talk. Uh, and you're looking for those people. If you're like me, so the narration for the film is going to come from these characters, these people that you find. So you need to find people, just like if you're making a fiction movie and you're casting the, the lead actor or actress, so uh, you're looking for someone who can, uh, who can hold the attention of the audience, you know, who is interesting enough. Um, and it's not always so easy. You know, find the, the right person and to be able to film them. Like a lot of things have to fall into place at once, you know, for you to have the, the, the subject and the location and everything that you want to have.
uh, if you can have a subject that allows you to give the audience the feeling of seeing many different angles, that is like many different types of people, but all connected by some physical location, for example, like a school. So uh, then you give the audience a kind of microcosm, a miniature version of the world. Sometimes the, the subject wants you to not film them, and you can feel it, even if they don't say it. And then you should move on, you know? You shouldn't really make people uncomfortable with your camera if you can uh, avoid it, if that's not the way your film is. So, uh, but you have to feel the, basically you want the longest possible shot that doesn't, uh, that doesn't uh, destroy your relationship with the subject, you know? As long as they're comfortable, as long as you're, you feel that you're getting something real, something honest, at a certain point that reality might break down. They might start to become very self-conscious about the camera being there so long, and, and they're like, you know, why, why me? Like, you know, especially in, the, especially in a place like Afghanistan, where people don't want to stand out from the crowd, you know? They want to be part of the group. So if you focus on one person, Eventually, they'll become nervous, or they'll become they'll become agitated because they'll think that you're singling them out, and other people are looking at the fact that you're filming this person, and then it becomes uncomfortable. So I try to spread around the attention, you know, and film um, many different people. If I have a student in the class who is my main character, and I really only want material of that student. I'm not only going to film that student because I don't want them to feel uncomfortable in their class. I don't want their other students to say to start picking on that person and say, "Wow, they're filming you only," and you know, you, you must be like uh, a model or something like that. I don't know. Whatever, uh, you know, like, uh, children can be terrible to each other, and you have to uh, <laughs> in that kind of situation. I'm. Uh, sometimes I'm filming material that I know that I probably won't use it. You know, but uh, I, I'm filming it because um, I'm trying to make it socially easier for my actual film subjects, you know, by filming a lot of other people as well. So that no one knows who the main subject is in the end. Uh, there's this psychological aspect to the way you film as well. If you're filming in like, group situations, it can be. You know, that uh, part of your job is um, to maintain a good relationship with your character that allows you to film them so uh, it might mean that you have to spread the attention. Mainly, the, the most important ingredient that you can have is uh, a lot of time. <laughs> because uh, people get used to you, you know. People get used to almost anything. And if you are a nice, open person that people like, and they accept you with your camera, then eventually, if you make yourself a little bit invisible, uh, you can tend to disappear. Of course, in the, in the footage, there's all kinds of places where people are looking at the camera or talking about the camera or the fact that I'm filming or something. Uh, I mean, I have 500 hours of material in this school, and uh, there must be thousands of, of times when people are looking at the camera. And, but in editing, you can simply cut out those places. Just like in a fiction film, you would cut out the place where the boom mic comes into the shot accidentally or something like that. You know? you're, you're creating an illusion, actually. Which, and the illusion is that you're invisible and no one can see you with your camera. But you're doing this illusion not by forcing people to act a particular way, but simply by taking enough time <laughs> that you have this material. Uh, without actually having to direct people. You're going to spend years and years making a film, say, uh, and uh, you're going to have a relationship with the people that you film after you make the film. They're going to see the film that you make about them. So I just think it's a good policy to film people that you really like them, instead of people that, uh, you know, like, for example, if there is like, if I went to the United States uh, and I started to make a film about Donald Trump, probably I would become tired like after a few months of this, and I would just decide that I hate it and I don't want to do it anymore because it's so unpleasant, you know, and so horrible. So uh, you have to have a subject that you can live with, uh, <laughs> you know, and if it's people that you like and you're going to show them in a nice way, 
then you're always going to have a good relationship with them afterwards, unless they think that you made a lot of money and they didn't get any or something like that. But in general, um, uh, it's better to have a good relationship with your with your subject and really to you know really respect them and to really like them, you know, because you'll feel it in the film. And uh, if you're going to live with the film for that amount of time, it's really nice to. Uh, to have people in the film that you actually like them. Uh, that's why, for me anyway, I, I don't know that I could do sort of heavy investigative journalism, you know, films about warlords or you know, films about, uh, you know, I don't know, some dictator. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, it's not, the, I, I'm happy that people make those kind of films, but for myself, just as a lifestyle, I'm not interested in in pursuing this stuff. I would much rather make a positive film about people that I like who have some difficult problem or situation and no one understands them or knows about them. This is just as useful as making a film where you say, you know, this uh, dictator in wherever, Indonesia in the 1960s, you know, killed a million people. Uh, also important to know about it, you know, but it's just not the kind of film that I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure I can make that. So I, I think you, as filmmakers, you have to decide like what's really comfortable for you, what makes sense. Because it's something you have to keep in mind that you have to live with this film for a long time, making it, and then after you make it, if it's any good especially, uh, people are always going to be asking you about it, and the people in your film will always be contacting you. Uh, the people I filmed in 1992 in, uh, in Russia are still contact me, contacting me all the time on Facebook. <laughs> uh, you know, from 25 years ago. <laughs> the people, I filmed them at the age of 13 and now they're like 38 and, uh, you know, grown people completely and they're calling me and telling me their problems in life and so on. It's like uh, you become the, I don't know, it's possible that you become this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of trusted figure for them, you know, and you're sort of, you're not part of their life so they can always, you know, uh, you're, you're sort of this um, approachable, non-dangerous person that they can always sort of like, you know, ask for advice or something. So anytime you make a film, you have to realize that you're, it's like you're getting married and you have to, you know, you have to live with this family even if you get divorced, you know, they'll still be with you somehow. <laughs> uh, so you, it's like that, you have to be careful like what, what you get into as a project. Well, uh, not in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, there are dangerous things, of course, there, but uh, I never had to run in Afghanistan. Uh, I think it's usually, it's kind of like, it's a bad form to run, you know? It's like, um, you look more guilty if you're running. <laughs> People are more likely to shoot you if you're running than if you're, like, calmly walking. So my, my style is always to calmly walk. <laughs> even if the even if the bullets are going you know, down the street, because then everyone knows you're. It's like not related to me. You know what I mean? Like yes, you are fighting, but I'm here doing my thing. And uh, this is the. Anyway, for me, it worked so far. <laughs> uh, mainly, I had problems in um, in the Gaza Strip, for example, it was really dangerous. Actually, Iraq was more dangerous. I felt like. Uh, uh, in Gaza, the Israeli soldiers will shoot at you. And, uh, this is this is the most dangerous thing. Uh, actually, not not Afghanistan. I think. Uh, you forget the dangerous thing when when you are shooting. Huh? You think? Well, the biggest like in a place like like Kabul, uh, the biggest danger is really that you would be kidnapped, um, something like that, you know. That, like, because this happens a lot in Afghanistan. People are kidnapped for money or for different reasons. Uh, if they kidnap an American, they could sell them to some, some jihadi group and, uh, you know, make $20,000, $30,000 or something like that. So there's a danger. There's kind of like a price on your head all the time on some level, and you're, you can be protected just by having a good relationship with the neighborhood. You know everybody, you know their parents, they like you. Like that neighborhood then, the, all those people, they know who is a stranger, who is uh, from the neighborhood, who is not from the neighborhood. 
and they will be the ones who protect you or not. You know, so you you really have to have a good relationship with the people around you, and then those people will maybe protect you. <laughs> this is the idea. Uh, by the time I was done filming in Afghanistan, I mean everyone in the neighborhood knew me. You know, uh, I'd walk down the main streets, and there would be people calling out my name from the shops. I have no idea, you know, who they are, uh, but they know who I am. You know. <laughs> uh, and it could be dangerous, but in this case, uh, it's kind of I felt like it was safer that everyone knew who I was and uh, accepted me. And uh, like, uh, as long as you have a good relationship with people, this is. But, but the, uh, honestly, though, in war zones and these kinds of places, there's no guarantee, and really anything can happen. And you can't like you shouldn't try to convince yourself that you're invincible, or or that you're. Uh, Invisible, or that you know nothing can happen to you because really, there's no protection. Like, uh, bad things can happen to you. Bad things can happen to the people you work with, to the people you're filming. So, uh, you have to be a little bit careful. Yeah, my preference is to keep shooting because unless someone is trying to kill you, so it's much. It's like your job to stay and record what's happening. You know, uh, I mean, you came all the way to Afghanistan, right? I mean something happens and you're there with the camera, your job is to film, you know, your job is to run away. It's the job of ordinary people to run away. <laughs> but it's not your job. Your job is to film the people running away, uh, to show what the life is like, what the atmosphere is like, you know. Uh, and yeah, this is an interesting question, yeah? Because uh, it's a question about um, kind of like, uh, Filmmaking morality, you know. Uh, what is your job as a filmmaker? You know. Uh, but then again, I mean, uh, we're filmmakers, but we're also human beings, and uh, we're human beings first, you know, before we're filmmakers. And you know, you're talking about a situation in a school where a teacher doesn't know how to do something. This is very innocent. I mean, you could film or you could not film. Okay, it's not a big deal in the end, you know. But maybe it is a big deal to that teacher. They don't want to be embarrassed in front of the camera, and they will like you more if you help them and stop filming, and uh, they'll have uh, more trust with you, and maybe you'll have better material in the future. It could be like this. But it can also happen that uh, you have to make these kind of moral decisions about whether to stop filming and to intervene. Uh, in a situation that's really critical, like maybe it's a life and death situation. Uh, if you're filming in a war zone, and uh, you know, it could happen that you uh, need to stop what you're doing and intervene in reality in order to save the life of someone, for example. But to see real change in the real world is somehow exciting to the audience, and I think in a way that it's very difficult to replicate in, in fiction, you know. In fiction, when people get older, it's through makeup, or they have another actor come in or something. In documentary, it's really happening, you know, and it's somehow, I don't know, yeah, this, uh, the thing that people love in, in, in uh, film and in uh, stories, really, is uh, this change, you know. And so, if you have a lot of time to film, then you can capture this change, and suddenly, without any story even, your, uh, your film has a kind of arc because of the changes that happen over time, if, if you're patient enough. I mean, mm -hmm. People are afraid of things they don't understand, and my whole idea is to make it familiar to them, and make it easy for them to approach it, you know, so that it would be as easy as, uh, as, uh, as Neo in the Nebuchadnezzar putting on uh, his, um, his training module and experiencing this uh, artificial reality, which gives them a real skill in the end. So the same thing with your audience. You may be giving them a fictionalized reality. You may be giving them a reality which is based on the real world. But what you're really doing is you're giving them uh, an artificial memory, uh, like a memory implant. It's, uh, it's something which they experience, your film. Uh, and it's like... Uh, a version of the real world that you are creating for them. So I have 500 hours of you know this. Uh, to me, it's like all interesting, right? Like all of my footage to me is very interesting. And this is like a, the illness of cinematographers that 
who we were in love with uh, all of our material. You know, if you do something really beautifully, well, you want to put it in the film. You know? Whereas a good editor might say, well, it's a nice shot, but it doesn't really belong in your story, so let's cut it. And of course, you'll feel sadness and you'll feel loss, you know, like uh, cutting off your arm or something like that, losing a child, you know. But in the end, the audience doesn't know what you filmed. The audience only knows what you show them in the end. And so the audience doesn't feel this sadness and this loss, you know, only if it's a terrible movie and they feel sadness and loss of <laughs> the two hours <laughs> that they spend watching it. Uh, but they don't have this, like you have to put your mind in the, in the head of the audience, you know, and think like, what's important? For, this, for the story, what's important for the film. Um, and that's the thing that guides you, you know, to, it should be the thing that guides you to, to make your decision, like to include this character and not that character, you know, because it's uh, somehow more interesting or more powerful or it's uh, uh, somehow better for whatever reason to choose this road instead of that road, you know. But you have to make decisions. And directing is really all about just making decisions in a rapid way. 